Okay, so thank you for the opportunity uh, to present. I'd like to thank my co-author, Mr. David Love, uh, who was instrumental in the thought processes behind this study. This was done when I was an unaccredited registrar at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and we're extrapolating this study uh, to uh, include this cohort uh, in a series, which I'll discuss later. Um, tibial plateau fractures are usually associated with high energy trauma. They often occur in combination with other injuries and can result in severe ongoing disability. Patients are often unhappy months to years down the track and this injury is a relatively common part of trauma orthopaedics. Everyone's aware that the outcomes of tibial plateau fractures are poor. Um, patients may need ongoing surgery, rehabilitation or a complete lifestyle adjustment having to give up activities particularly sport, uh, that they really enjoy. It's often a prelude to a total knee replacement or debilitating post-traumatic arthritis. However, it was noted by the authors that not all patients with the same injury had the same prognosis and there was little evidence that the outcome of the fracture was associated with the efficacy of fixation or the severity of the injury. We often review patients in clinic with severe osteoarthritis that are still working as labourers 40, 45 hours a week or a patient severely debilitated by mild to moderative changes on x-ray. Um, we also noticed that there was little correlation between the adequacy of the initial fixation and the development of post-traumatic arthritis. Our overall hypothesis was that there is a correlation between the severity of initial injury and the severity of post-traumatic arthritis. Our second hypothesis was that there is a correlation between the efficacy of initial fixation and then the severity of post-traumatic arthritis. Weevil and Marsh described a series of 31 tibial plateau fractures that were treated with either external fixation or limited internal fixation of the articular surface. At a minimum five-year follow-up, the range of motion averaged from 3 to 120 degrees and the knee scores were relatively acceptable. Um, however, no knees were back to pre-injury levels and most had some residual pain. Stannard looked at 39 tibial plateau fractures and at early follow-up, no patient had required additional surgical intervention and only two patients demonstrated any malalignment. However, this was looking at a six-month follow-up only. Burkson suggested that post-traumatic arthritis in long-term follow-up was associated with a number of risk factors. Um, these included advanced age, those that undergone meniscal resection, and then those with the residual tilt of the tibial plateau. Surprisingly, there was very little association between residual, residual articular step-off and progressive degenerative changes. Saylor described 21 patients treated with external fixation for complex uh, tibial plateau fractures, chapters 5 and 6, that reported good outcomes with patients going on to unite. However, I do question these authors' definition of good because uh, there were three major pin site infections resulting in osteomyelitis and five patients needed osteotomy and realignment. So for them to get up and describe that as good, I'm not entirely sure that was the right term. <coughs> Excuse me. Schnitz probably presented uh, the most effective paper looking at 47 patients with a five-year follow-up who sustained open reduction internal fixation of a combination of different types of tibial plateau fractures. They reported six wound infections and approximately one third of patients underwent further procedures requiring a general anaesthetic. Only 70% of these patients made it back to full employment and about 16% returned to part-time work. Uh, the authors also found that elderly patients did much worse than younger patients in terms of returning uh, to pre-morbid function and also there was a high risk of complications in an elderly cohort. Interestingly, uh, Schmitz found that this was regardless of the fracture type. So the Schatzka 1 did just as badly as the Schatzka 6s. Looking at our methods, between 2007 and 2009, all patients who sustained a fracture of the tibial plateau were identified using the VOTOR database. Fractures were classified by the authors uh, as for the, classific the Schatzka classification system. Patient records were then reviewed to determine age, gender, mechanism of injury, fixation methods, complications and subsequent surgery. We reviewed all the imaging and assessed the quality of the reduction uh, using a system that was designed by Mr Love. The latest post-operative radiographs were also reviewed to assess the severity of osteoarthritis and then outcomes were assessed uh, using radio radiographic measures. Clinical outcomes we obtained from the notes and these were defined as, acute, as the development of acute, subacute and chronic complications 
a need for reoperation and the presence of pain at the final consultation. We also compared our immediate post-operative radiograph findings using uh, Mr Love's classification to assess the efficacy of fixation to a variety of osteoarthritis uh, grades on the post uh, post-operative x-rays at least six months down the track. These were the, we used the All Black classification, the Kelgren Lawrence classification and also the Rasmussen classification. This is the classification system that um, Mr Love devised. So it was graded from one to seven, one being a perfect reduction in the joint surface uh, right down to seven where there was no restoration made. What we felt was important was the presence of a step uh, of a less or greater than two millimetres and then whether there was a gap present as well. Moving on to results, we identified 51 fractures in 48 patients, uh, about two thirds male, 15 female. Most injuries were due to high energy trauma, so pedestrian versus car, falls from ladders, etc. Uh, this graph displays the, the different type of mechanisms that are associated uh, with this injury. Bear in mind the Royal Melbourne Hospital is a trauma centre, so this is heavily skewed uh, towards high energy trauma. Um, pedestrian versus car was uh, the, the highest number, the highest uh, category for tibial plateau fractures. The four greater than uh, three metres, that was a classification based on the ambulance officers and that was often inaccurate. Um, so for example, there was a fall from a three-storey building that had been classified by the AMBOs as a fall less than three metres. So uh, this is relying on, on AMBOs data and I think that was actually a higher energy fall. These are the types of uh, Schatzka fractures that presented. Type 2 were the most common, which was um, depressed on the lateral side. Uh, type 6s are usually open injuries or associated with other trauma and again a reflection of the high impact often associated with these injuries. One third of the fractures were open injuries. Uh, this is more than my experience at other centres because the Royal Melbourne receives a lot of trauma from around the state. The open injuries were usually treated as a staged procedure which we defined as a delay to theatre by five days or more. The staging was usually due to uh, soft tissue injury but there are a handful of patients that weren't uh, able to go to theatre because they were uh, unstable and had multiple other teams involved there. Uh, of interest, no patients were delayed due to compartment syndrome at the time of presentation. This is the type of fixation that we had. Seven fractures were treated non-operatively and fract fractures that were fixed internally were usually uh, with a lateral plate uh, via a lateral incision. Of the internally fixed fractures, synthetic bone graft was used in approximately 30, in 36 cases um, and perioperative antibiotics were given in all cases. This is looking at uh, the post-operative x-rays um, and this was uh, done with myself and Mr Love. We also correlated this with the radiological reports if they were available. We had a 290 day follow-up with a range of six months to three years. Over half the patients had some radiographic evidence of osteoarthritis as defined by the authors, either medial, lateral or both compartments. And again, this is a relatively short follow-up period. So these are patients that are presenting with signs of OA uh, within six months uh, of the injury. Most fractures went on to unite. The four that failed to unite were treated with a revision iris and bone grafting. Uh, two of those patients went on to unite and the other two were treated at another institution and weren't available for follow-up. Uh, the fractures that were non-unions were all open injuries and associated with other trauma. 40% of the patients who gone on went on to have additional surgery. This is usually removal of metal and the second most common was an arthroscopy. This is the classification system that was designed by Mr Love and the majority of patients were fixed uh, with a, a restored joint surface, meaning that on the immediate post-operative x-ray we could not see a gap or a step in the articular surface. Uh, one patient underwent an above knee amputation, so that left 50 knees that we could look at. Um, and the other half of the patients, their immediate post-operative x-rays had a gap, a step or both. Using a linear regression analysis, we actually couldn't find a clear correlation between our classification system and the severity of the tibial plateau fracture based on the Schatzka classification system. That is, a Schatzka 6 
type fracture uh, was not associated uh, with poor reduction in internal fixation. So the more complex the fracture system is, it, it doesn't affect how well we can fix it. We then compared our immediate post-operative radiograph findings to a variety of arthritis classification systems on the, the, the follow-up, the latest follow-up X-ray. So we looked at the All Black uh, classification, Kelvin Alliance and the Rasmussen classification and again using a linear regression analysis we couldn't find any statistical significant correlation. We did find a very weak correlation uh, between how well the joint surface has been restored to the All Black, all black classification. That is, patients that demonstrated a gap or a step immediately postoperatively had a relatively weak association uh, with the development of loss of joint space or bone attrition. However, this wasn't statistically significant and when we included other classification systems, we didn't demonstrate uh, any association. So, in conclusion, this is the largest study uh, that we could find in the recent literature uh, looking at outcomes of tibial plateau fractures. Uh, tibial plateau fractures are generally associated with poor outcomes and particularly at high risk of development of osteoarthritis of the knee regardless of the initial fracture pattern or the efficacy of initial fixation. Many patients required repeat surgery and even though we didn't formally evaluate this, from reading through the notes, patients often reported pain and functional limitations. The next phase of this study is to contact all these patients and undertake formal clinical outcomes using uh, knee scores and SF36 scores and we're going to correlate these to the imaging findings to determine whether patients' functional limitations are associated with the initial fracture pattern and efficacy of fixation.